prime differentiator between the human animal and the human being is reason. And because it's so important, we need to dwell around the idea or the notion of reason for a minute or so. It's important because uh, from the Greeks through to the Renaissance philosophers and through to uh, modern day philosophers and actually you don't hear the word reason used a great deal in uh, so-called spiritual work <laughs> there are various reasons for that but uh, Gorgiev used it he talked of objective reason and the reason that we're talking about is not particularly uh, what my, many people might consider to be logic. Uh, logic says something like if x equals y and y equals z then x equals z. You know, these are empty statements effectively but modern philosophers and logicians delight in playing around with those kind of things and um, <coughs> well, if that keeps them happy then so be it. But the reason we're talking about is more the ability to, well, as Gurdjieff implies in the word or the phrase objective reason, to be objective. So if you are involved in some dispute with your neighbor over a barking dog, say, say your dog is barking in the morning and wakes your neighbor, then if you could be objective and apply objective reason then you would say well yes it's you know it's it's not right that my dog is barking in the morning an unreasonable person would probably say well it's my dog it's my my house my dog can do whatever the hell it wants in my house you know that, and that is the attitude you get from probably quite a few people so reason is the ability to a large extent to step outside your own private little hell and view the wider perspective and maybe we'll go into how wide that perspective could be a little bit later on so the human animal has virtually no reason or very little of it <laughs> if you think I'm being unkind I'm not this is the way most of us are uh, and the reasons for that which I'll get into shortly. The human being has in many situations the ability to apply reason. Not every situation because uh, the human being still lives in a body, still has the human animal to contend with. What um, characterizes a human animal is the passions the emotions, things like hatred, um, envy, fear, greed, you know there's a long list of these things isn't there, you know, the, the emotions that um, are effectively derived from some notion of survival and that may not be immediately clear to you but uh, I'll go into it more or less uh, uh, straight away actually so the human animal is an animal that wants to survive. This drive for survival was well recognized in ancient times. People called it the canatus. It's there in every animal. You see an animal either hunting or an animal that is um, being hunted and you see the canatus at work and you see the terror in the eyes of um, a deer that has been felled by a lion, say, and you see the canatus at work. Um, so, survival is the main driver. Now, if things happen that threaten your survival, then you will feel what are traditionally called negative emotions hatred, fear, and so on. If things are going well for you, things that reinforce your survival, then you'll feel what v people very often call positive emotions, you know, think positively. They're passions, both what we call p 
positive emotions and negative emotions are passions. They are our responses to external stimuli. So we might um, get a new partner that we think is uh, particularly attractive and so on and so forth and all of a sudden we feel um, more uplifted more positive uh, and our world goes well. We lose a whole pile of money and we feel threatened. Now these <coughs> those are sort of I suppose abstract but if you are for example on a, a road driving along and someone cuts you up yeah you know your your blood pressure is going to go up you're going to feel threatened you're going to get angry and the road is a very very good um, barometer really for how people are truly reacting to each other because they're in a slightly competitive situation so this is the human animal at work it will always protect its territory and actually uh, more than that it will try and grab the territory of others so if you look at our society and you look at the way that uh, large corporations work, the way governments work and so on. The people who are involved in those organizations are essentially predatory. <coughs> they have to be to get where they are. They are the, the sort of alpha um, animals in the, in the zoo. They are the ones who have been most successful at effectively um, exploiting the weaker. Again, this is all animal behavior. Lions eat weaker animals um, even within a particular species. <coughs> a dominant male is very often, or and also maybe a dominant female, are typically established. And if any animal tries to threaten that order, then there's trouble and the old guard may win or it may not but this is this is the human animal driven by passions and we see that today uh, you, you know more than we've seen it maybe for 50 fi well at least 50 years <coughs> nationalism is a a direct manifestation of the human animal territory this is my territory everybody else keep out um, the way that large corporations consume smaller businesses and grow into new territory into new products it's all predatory and in fact um, there's an excellent book called sapiens I would recommend if you want to really understand the human animal then you should read sapiens I uh, forget the author's name but it was a New York Times bestseller at one point so it's not difficult to find and Sapiens tracks the history of human say, uh, yes, um, sorry, Homo Sapiens we became the most dominant form of uh, of the human species because we were the most aggressive and the most cunning <laughs> there were several Species of, species of humans, um, the Neanderthal being one, and of course the Neanderthal is portrayed as being this sort of brutish, clumsy thing. It's not true. Neanderthals were fairly intelligent. Uh, what they lacked was the cunning of the sa Homo sapiens and the ability to create abstractions. And that's a whole nother topic, and one that I made a video on because uh, it's a very interesting one. Uh, you know, abstractions like nation, abstractions like corporation, these things don't exist in reality. They're just abstract notions. But human beings are very, very good at, or Homo sapiens, you know, form this ability to, to um, group behind an abstraction. And because of that, they formed large groups that could overcome smaller groups. And so... Yeah, we're a particularly unpleasant species that um, has come to dominate. And that unpleasantness is now being turned upon ourselves. 
So this is the human animal, purely driven by s the survival instinct um, in the main. So I come to the human being. A human being is a creature that can apply reason to situations. Now, our societies are not completely animalistic. If they were, then people would be murdering each other for the least little slight. Fortunately, we have laws and what some people call the thin veneer of society. Well, thank goodness for that thin veneer, because it w if it wasn't there, then murders and theft and all kinds of crimes would be you know, just an everyday affair for all of us. So, you may be aware of the breakdown of law that happened in Montreal, I think it was in the 60s, possibly the 70s, and the police went on strike, I think, for 18 hours. During that time, revenge murders took place. Uh, widespread looting, theft, you name it, murder. And um, the police, I think the police cut short their, uh, their strike because the whole, you know, this is a so-called civilized uh, city. In various African nations, when law has broken down for protracted periods, then behavior has uh, degenerated into cannibalism. And I'm not picking on Africa, it's just that that is where the rule of law in a few countries happened to break down for protracted periods of time. If, it, if law broke down for protracted periods of time in any Western nation, you would end up with the same thing. So this is a human animal um, being let free. Uh, fortunately, we have laws. Laws are some measure of the application of reason. And the laws basically say that, well, to a large extent, we need to respect each other's um, property and relationships and um, territory. Now, it's mainly a territory thing. And because of that, then, we don't have this widespread violence and uh, theft and so on. So there's um, an example of reason being used in our society to some extent. Now, this doesn't stop people who are wealthy using very, very expensive lawyers from using you know, reason, so-called, for their own ends. It's well known that if you want to an illegal case, you just get the best lawyers. It doesn't really matter to a lot, in many circumstances whether you're guilty or innocent. You just get the best lawyers. <coughs> but reason is the ability to view things in a wider context than uh, wider than our own individual uh, little needs and desires. So reason would say that it's not a good idea for people to lie to each other because lying creates confusion and the confusion is actually a negative thing because it causes people to act in ways that are suboptimal. If someone lies to you about, um, well, for example, the route between one place and another, they just lie to you as a bit of a joke, then you are going to sp maybe spend hours and hours traveling in a direction that um, doesn't take you any nearer to where you want to go. So it's the same when politicians lie to the electorate uh, the electorate believe one thing is happening and something else is happening and so the electorate suffers. And same when businesses lie about how they're polluting the environment or how they're making their profits or whether they're exploiting underage workers and you know, the endless lies that take place. <coughs> so the human being is actually a very, very rare thing. <laughs> You know, there are shades of grey, obviously. Um, the pure animal behaviour, then you'll see that in uh, battlefield situations or invading armies, rape, pillage, murder. Um, the human animal just has free reign in that circumstance. Um, but the human, the human being is a very, very rare thing. A, uh, a being that can apply reason in situations and 
uh, assess the situation fairly and act in an impartial manner is incredibly rare. So rare that maybe none of us have met such a person. Or very few of us, at least, anyway. <coughs> the The fact that there are so few human beings is that to be to be able to exercise reason means that you need to have in some way uh, been able to control the passions, the emotions. Because there's no point being in a situation where you need to use a fair and objective assessment uh, when your passions are telling you to steal or to get your own back or to get some kind of revenge um, or to make yourself appear bigger than you are. Most social situations consist of people bigging themselves up. There's no reason there at all. There's no thinking of, well, you know, here's my friend, you know, let's have a good time together. And particularly as people get older. Because as people get older, they usually get more and more empty within themselves. And so they have to apply more and more um, strategies to make themselves look big. And that bigging up usually consists of boasting about property or various achievements, you know, what they've acquired or done in their life. So um, the ability of people to act in a reasonable way it diminishes very often. And so our planet is almost entirely populated by human animals. Uh, I think it's part of what Gurdjieff would call the terror of the situation. And there have been enlightenment figures who have to some extent helped us apply reason so that we make a tolerable environment for ourselves. You know, dumping thousands, millions of tons of plastic in the ocean is not a reasonable thing to do. <laughs> Chopping down the rainforest is not a reasonable thing to do. <coughs> Polluting the air is not a reasonable thing to do. Exhausting the Earth's resources is not a reasonable thing to do. These are all the actions of a human animal that has no control over its passions. And unfortunately, the people who lead our society, both commercially, economically, and um, politically, are human animals in the main. That's how they've got there. So it's a fairly scary situation. And if you want to understand why mankind, the human species, just goes around in circles, then it's because... <coughs> The human animal will always indulge its um, its appetite for dominating the weaker, and so you all you end up with is, with is all the psychopaths and the madmen at the top of society until it breaks down. Yeah, you know, like in ancient Rome, n uh, characters like Nero um, and Caligula, totally insane, totally power power, you know, totally possessed by their passions. And this is what we have today, because the laws are not sufficient to constrain all the lunatics that are at the top of our society, then we are seeing insane behavior. And it um, is a prelude to uh, the degeneration of uh, Western civilization, at least, anyway. It's just the way these things work. Um, so, to summarize, Human animals are driven entirely by the survival instinct. Uh, human beings can exercise some level of reason in their dealings with each other and in the way they organize their own lives. Uh, but human beings are very, very rare individuals. And uh, you know, compared with an animal, a lion in full attack, uh, a reasonable person might look weak. However, a reasonable person 
would not be weak. A reasonable person would actually pull out his gun and shoot the damn thing in the head. Um, because that is, <laughs> at the end of the day, in all of us, the reasonable person also has the animal. And as Gorgiev said, the wolf can devour the lamb at any moment in time. 